for the nation. South Africa is back in the front pages again this week. Uh, you've just returned from a trip to Africa. As we sit right now on the close of 1985, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the situation in South Africa? Huh. Well, I've been following it for a long time. And as a British person, we were all kind of brought up on South Africa. It's one of my earliest memories is of it being expelled from the British Commonwealth um, for its racial policy. And I've been saying sort of repetitively for years that if the government doesn't change, it will be changed by force. There will be a revolution. And I suppose I've been saying that as someone who thinks that would be a just thing to happen. And I think that though the revolution isn't around the corner, it has now begun. So to that extent, I guess I'd have to say I was an optimist. But um, in another way, it makes me sad because it needn't have come to this. It needn't have got this bad, and it's going to get worse. And a lot of people, good people, are going to die. Um, and that's needless. So I, that doesn't make me a pessimist, but it, it qualifies my optimism. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. Our topic, South Africa. Our guest, Christopher Hitchens. He's Washington correspondent for The Nation. Let's start off telling people about your magazine before we talk about South I'm Africa. It up. That's great. Well, The Nation is the oldest weekly magazine in the US founded in 1865 by a group of abolitionists and liberals and we've held true to that tradition ever since. We wouldn't mind being called the uh, left end of the mainstream spectrum. Um, we come out every week. We are published at 72 Fifth Avenue, New York City, from which subscriptions can be obtained. Thank you very much. And I write a column for it from Washington, but I sometimes take that column elsewhere and I just took it to Southern Africa. It, uh, how many subscribers here? And also, it's got a UK price on it. Uh, how many subscribers in Great Britain? Good question. I think we have about 70,000 subscribers, all told. Um, I don't think very many of them are in, are in Great Britain. Very few of my friends there do read it, I blush to say. Um, we think the number of readers per copy is very high. A lot of libraries and institutions of higher learning take us. I don't know what our true readership is. I should have, I should have uh, checked it out. Uh, probably about a quarter of a million on, on 70,000 it would be, um, which is far too few, given the generally conservative tone of the American press and mass media these days. About your column, uh, mm -hmm. first of all, the reason for your trip? Wanted to keep myself up to date. I've been in South Africa. I've been in Namibia and Angola. I've been in Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe was a great uh, passion of mine for a long time. Um, I wanted to go this time to Zambia, to Lusaka, to see the African National Congress. I succeeded in seeing them and in seeing Bishop Tutu uh, when he met with the African National Congress. Actually, in Zimbabwe, I went to Harare as well. It was the first time, I think, that they've officially met. I mean, he has contacted them before, but they're a banned organization in his country. And uh, it was quite a delicate matter for him to meet in public at a World Council of Churches meeting with the leadership of the organization that says it will take power if necessary by force. Your intention was to get into South Africa itself? Well, they've just put a freeze on all press visas now. I mean, they, uh, they've got a lot to hide and uh, they hide it rather clumsily um, by means of censorship, banning orders, restrictions and so on. Even now in South Africa itself, you need a permit uh, to go to Soweto or to go to any of the black townships, unless you're a black person, in which case you're not allowed to leave the township, and if you're a black reporter, they can't tell you you can't go where you're forced to live. Um, so you didn't even attempt Those kind to get of anomalies um, aside, I mean, what, what one has in South Africa is a pretty fully-fledged totalitarian state. Mm -hmm. You didn't even attempt to get in, or you knew right off the bat you'd be denied? I wasn't going to be let in, no. Okay. Uh, the, the, um, the thing that's interesting about this column, and uh, we hear a lot of references to the African National Congress uh, without many explanations about what it is. Perhaps you could tell our viewers. Well, the ANC, as everyone calls it, there's a slogan in South Africa that says, you ANC nothing yet, um, was started in 1912 as a very modest lobby for what were then called native rights. Um, and it was... <sighs> something like what the NAACP used to be here, fairly polite, well-mannered, middle-class, fairly Christian, at any rate religious, was the main denominations in South Africa. Um, and it, it kept on in that vein for several decades, 
legal, it was not a legal organization, it wasn't banned until the 1950s. But as the uh, white minority moved to consolidate power absolutely by law to say that uh, South Africa would be totally segregated and that uh, no black person would ever be allowed to uh, frame the decision on how he or she would live, um, the Congress had to become more militant. And in fact, in 1961, it took the decision to set up an armed wing called Umkonto Wesizwe, which means the Spear of the Nation. Uh, but it had already been banned by then. Um, so it's really a rather classic case of the evolution of a modest lobbying uh, pressure group into a revolutionary organization by force of circumstance. I'd like to read a paragraph from this, uh, because it's um, something I don't think I was aware of to the references to apartheid before. It says, the political strength of the ANC lies in its advocacy of a non-racial as opposed to multiracial society. Apartheid, as people tend to forget, does not merely separate black from white. It minutely denominates blacks by tribe and language. It demarcates Indians from Cape colored. It separates Chinese and Muslim. and even designates Japanese for commercial purposes as honorary whites. Your comments? Yeah, it's worth remembering that because um, apartheid people think of as literally a black and white question, which in many ways it is, but the, uh, the system operates really on a basis of divide and rule. For example, um, in Soweto, most of the policemen tend to be recruited from uh, Zulu rural areas, so as to use black on black, but it's a different language that they speak, for example, and a different background. It's a rather tragic thing to see. Um, you stole my favorite point already, or rather you didn't steal it, but you mentioned it, that uh, they show the real absurdity of, of racialism, um, that the Japanese are counted as honorary Aryans, honorary whites, because they have a good commercial relationship with South Africa. Um, it's also important to remember that the, the ruling national party in South Africa is the only ruling party in the world uh, that took the other side in the Second World War. I mean, most of its leaders were quite openly and explicitly on the side of Hitler. Um, and because of his racial theory, it used to be uh, officially anti-Semitic as a party. Now, because of its relationship with Israel, that's slightly been uh, watered down, but not by no means entirely. There's a very strong streak of anti-Jewish prejudice in the, in the uh, Africana leadership also. So that um, for the ANC, the task is very difficult because it has to, as well as oppose white fascist ideology, it has to prevent tribalism and other kinds of racial feeling breaking out among the different groups of the oppressed. And in my view, its greatest achievement is to have done that. On its executive in exile in Lusaka, there are Indians, there are colored people, there are quite a number of whites in the leadership also. Um, by colored, we mean those of mixed race. We, just for this purpose, we borrow the official definition. And there are different kinds of African uh, all different languages and tribes are represented. And they say that in, in the South Africa of the future, your race should not count. It shouldn't be a social category at all um, in, deci in deciding your citizenship. We have a caller on the line, so I don't know if you can answer this question very mm -hmm. quickly. But uh, given that view of the South Africa as the ANC would like it, what happens to the political side? Well, the political side um, is, I think, inevitably socialist mm -hmm. in that... Uh, the, the belief that there is no meaningful definition of, uh, racial definition of a person's right uh, and the, necessitates really belief in the equality, brotherhood, if you like, of man. And uh, if you say that that's socialist, they say, yes, it is. Some of them would say they were communist also. So you're, many people say that will automatically invite the influence of uh, Soviet Union uh, into the Well, Africa. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if that's what this question is has in mind. Okay. I certainly won't duck the question. Let's uh, go to the phones. Uh, we have about 45 minutes to take your calls for Christopher Hitchens. The telephone numbers are on the scre screen as a question or a comment comes to mind throughout this hour. Let's take our first call from Lakewood, New Jersey. Hi, Mr. Hutchins. This is one of your subscribers. Oh, hello. Hi. Um, Merry Christmas. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to say is um, I just can't understand this government a lot, you know, just going along with this. What really upsets me is the right wing that keeps saying that the Zulus do not go along, or, you know, go along with the ending of apartheid that they want to uh, try to, um, I'm just a little bit nervous, 
the... Um, Don't worry, everyone is. I'm <laughs> trembling. They want to, um, in other words, uh, go along with the government, help the government and overcome this. But they don't realize that the Zulus are the policemen. And that's why, you know, it, it, sort of, it kind of reminds me of uh, Clarence Pendleton. <laughs> of the, you know, I have never seen such a boot licker in all my life. He really, I can't even watch him. He really upsets me. But I, I just hope that the uh, Congress gets the government, uh, you know, gets uh, Mr. Reagan off his desk there and does a little bit more to try to, because they really are embarrassed when they feel as though this country is not backing them. Okay, thanks for the All call. Right. Well, let's not malign the Zulus. I mean, uh, it's a bit harsh, I think, to compare anyone to Clarence Pendleton, especially at the season of goodwill. Uh, the Zulus are, of course, opposed to apartheid. Uh, there's no question about that. One of the founders of the African National Congress was Chief Albert Lutuli, who was a Zulu leader and uh, was, I think I'm right in saying, the first black man ever to win the Nobel Prize in 1955. Um, there are many Zulus who support the ANC. There is an organization led by Chief Gatcha Butelezi. Excuse me, I'll say that again. Chief Gatcha Butelezi. It's called Inkata. It's a Zulu organization and, and political party, and it's tribally based and uh, tribally organized. Um, it is, of course, not in favor of white minority rule, but it is hostile to the ANC and its non-racial policy. Um, and as a result, it is an organization with which the South African government can do business in pursuit of a divide and rule policy. But you shouldn't mistake Zulus for Uncle Tom's, and I, I think it would, be, it would be inaccurate as well as unfair to say that. Go out to California for our next call. Where is your town? Santa Fe, California. It's about 17 miles northeast of San Diego. <coughs> okay. Your question or comment? Well, I have both. I'd like to ask you a question, Susan. Mm -hmm. appreciate the program, but I, I would like to make a comment uh, regarding your guest. First of all, you know, he uh, kind of alludes to the fact that he would like to be referred to as uh, as left. Uh, let me just say, uh, this man is not just left. He is a pro-communist uh, mindset. Uh, the uh, South Africa, they, you know, the communists are writing uh, an issue, taking a worthwhile issue. Uh, you know, anti-apartheid is certainly a worthwhile thing to, to be involved in. But these people are doing just what, uh, you know, the ANC is, there's no doubt that they're communist infiltrated. They fly the communist flag at uh, talks. We've seen that with, with Bishop Tutu standing there with the flag flying behind him. The raised clinched uh, uh, fist, clinched fist. And also uh, the, uh, uh, the apartheid uh, movement, you know, is wrong. And these, these people are writing it, but they're going to do just what they did in Ethiopia. And, you know, it was just announced today that they're moving populations in Ethiopia, not to, not because of drought, but because to relocate them for for control politically. Now, the the uh, the thing I'd like to say is, some months ago, I watched your program with Jerry Falwell when he came back from South Africa. Mm -hmm. In the course of watching that program, after his remarks, a Mr. Lowry, a very uh, hip minister with fancy, you know, really far out dress appeared and he he did the big lie and he said that after after Jerry Farwell talked he said and I'm not a pro Jerry Farwell person I was curious and I watched this he said that uh, Jerry Farwell didn't even visit with the people that he flew around in helicopters and he spoke uh, from helicopters how could he ever really communicate and find out what's happening in South Africa is black is being set against black there are people who are in leadership positions that are positive and pro-America that are, you know, that this man would like to call Uncle Tom's, but they are not. They are people who are set uh, and, and are working toward a democratic solution. But okay. these others, these radicals, won't let them. They're doing, they're killing them just like they did in, uh, it's a communist method. They did it in uh, South Vietnam. They've done it all over the world. How about that question for us? The okay. question I'm asking you is, how come you didn't expose Lowry? about the big lie. How come the press just sat and gobbled him up and applauded? They sneered, their questions toward Falwell were pointed, uh, slanted, and uh, their questions to Lowry were just uh, applauded. Whose questions? Some of you as the press, as C-SPAN, didn't mm. catch that, didn't investigate it, didn't reveal it, 
didn't bring out the big lie and why they were playing this down and why Falwell basically has been silenced. And okay. you know, why did you folks do that? All right, and uh, thank you for the, the comments. So C-SPAN is a public affairs network, doesn't do any investigative reporting. Uh, so that's the short answer. But I'd like to get your comments to them. Any observations? Yeah, I don't, I don't mind uh, pointed or snarky questions either. And um, um, I don't feel that they're illegitimate. And I don't mind even the one you asked me, which I'll come to right away. Um, the South African Communist Party um, is now and was for a very long time, has been for a very long time, the only political party in South Africa that doesn't discriminate on grounds of race in its membership. Uh, this has earned it uh, a position of respect and admiration among a lot of black people, as you'd expect. I think it's to the credit of the Communist Party. I'm afraid I can't think of any other way of putting it, that that's always been their view. It's the only thing that is to their credit in every other respect, politically speaking, they're an unusually conformist Moscow line group. But some of their people, in particular some of their lawyers, uh, have acted, in my opinion, uh, heroically in the past. Now, what makes me uh, so confident about what I say about the ANC, uh, and what makes me so sure that uh, Jerry Falwell is yet again either being sold a bill of goods or selling one or both, is this. Um, there is no survey of African opinion in South Africa that does not consistently reveal, uh, whatever the question is and however it's put, that the popular leader is Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela is the honorary president of the African National Congress. If I'm wrong about that, um, I it can be demonstrated very easily, um, the following method. Nelson Mandela can be freed from prison and invited to contest a democratic election. I would abide by that verdict and so would he. Um, it's a very simple challenge to make. I made it on a television the other day with Mr. William Keyes, the black PR man who the South African government has hired in this town for I think it's 350 grand, which I don't think he's worth. His response was to me was to say that that would be like calling for the release of Charles Manson. Um, if you'll buy that, you'll buy Jerry Falwell. Um, I will simply repeat that I, I will abide by the result of a democratic election. I, I think Nelson Mandela would win it. But if you want to prove me wrong, you have to address your question to the South African government. Sheboygan, Wisconsin, <coughs> good morning. Hi. I have about four questions I'd like to ask okay. your guest speaker on South Africa. Okay. Before I begin, happy holidays. Thank you. Same to you, sir. Like and this. I don't know if he will be able to answer them, but here goes anyway. Uh, it seems that tribalism has always been a fierce force in all of Africa. Shows little sign of ever stopping. What makes you think that this fierce tribalism would stop in South Africa if the blacks were to get any kind of power. Mm -hmm. Second point, all the boycotts have been li lifted against Russia. And for anyone to tell me that South Africa is the worst political po force in the world and leave out the genocide that goes on in Cambodia, the hostilities that Russia is putting against Afghanistan is very naive. It seems that we have selective indignation against the South Africans. Okay. Next point, it seems that little is said. It seems that the news media is saying that the South African armed forces is insignificant. They have yet begun to flex their muscles. From what I understand, they have a large standing army, very powerful air force, mm -hmm. and an effective navy. What would be the role of this force if the whites felt that their backs were against the wall? Okay. The last point is uh, there is still in the news media very little coverage about atrocities in the rest of black Africa. Mm -hmm. Very little coverage is given how blacks leave other parts of Africa and go into South Africa. Don't get me wrong, the conditions aren't that great but they appear to be better than in their homeland. In some of the border areas between uh, South Africa and the rest of black Africa, there's barbed wire. People are shot, their bodies are left to rot. These are by black governments that let this be. 
I hope you'll be able to answer my questions. I've called a couple other times and given this kind of questions, and they seem to be always looked over. Okay. Thank you very much for the Take care. Bye-bye. Well, let me try not to disappoint you. On uh, your first question on tribalism, yes, it's the curse of Africa, and every African nationalist knows it. And it's the reason for the existence of the OAU, which is in itself the Organization of African Unity, one of the most disappointing organizations in uh, the modern world, is that at least they recognize that that is the problem. It's, uh, it's a double problem because the borders of Africa uh, that, that uh, denominate nations and differentiate states uh, were not drawn by Africans. They were drawn by colonial powers. A very large number of them were drawn by my fellow countrymen, the British, and don't follow uh, or conform to uh, tribal or other differences at all. They're drawn for the convenience of outsiders, and Africa is still saddled with that. Um, what I was saying about the ANC is that it realizes that this is, this is the main problem and says that to join the organization, you give up your claim as uh, a tribal or otherwise racially defined person. You have to try and decolonize, as it were, your mind. And all I can all I can say for them is that they have made that leap of recognition and they are the only organization in the country that does give the promise of overcoming tribal feeling but it would be a fool or an optimist or a utopian who didn't recognize the the depth of it I mean for example in Zimbabwe where all Africans were agreed that white colonial rule should uh, cease that was about all they did agree about and, and there is still a very deep going uh, political quarrel uh, between um, the Matabili and the Mashana uh, in the country as we speak. Um, whatever the answer to that is, though, it is not white colonial rule. I think uh, we have to move beyond that stage. I hope you don't think I've dodged your question then on tribalism. On the double standard and the boycott thing, um, <clears throat> yes and no. Um, I didn't say anything about Cambodia or Afghanistan because I was asked about South Africa. but. I would have done if I had been asked. Um, the difference, I think, the inescapable difference, is this. Um, the Soviet economy is not dependent on Western capitalist corporations. The South African economy, to a very large extent, is. That's to say we are, in the West, responsible for South Africa, in, not just in the moral sense, but in the practical sense. Money is made by American and British corporations principally, but also by French ones and West German ones uh, from that economy uh, its labor practices and its uh, system of double oppression that's to say people oppressed both as workers and as people of a different color is in our camp um, thus the call for sanctions and boycotts is not just a matter of a gesture it's a matter of accepting and recognizing a responsibility that I think distinguishes it from say the Polish economy Although, Though if you were to say to me that the Polish economy is largely underwritten by Western banks, you'd be right, and I'd be in favor of taking the point in the same way. I'm not for a double standard. Um, on the uh, army and the, sorry. Can so I interrupt you at yes, that point? Uh, we've got a caller that's been waiting a bit, and rather than rack uh, up his well, long distance charges, why don't we take that call and we'll go back to the last two questions. I just, the, the, I'm anxious because the questioner said he'd had his questions we'll him, sloughed off before. <laughs> I'm keen to take them on the chin. Okay, we will get back to them. I've got okay, them written sure. down. Portsmouth, Virginia. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. First of all, Christopher, I'd like to encourage you. I think that you're one of the most finest men that I've had observed in the last few years. Well. I'd like to make two comments, and I'd like to make an invitation to you. First of all, president of Glory Enterprise and Educational Foundation, 1317 East Bramington Avenue, North Virginia, 23504. Now, I know you're smiling, but the reason I give you that, Christopher, is because I'm hoping that you would have the opportunity to come to Virginia. I think that the citizens in Virginia need people like you to address them because of their lack of understanding of world or global problems. What you speak as we have to go beyond white colonialism, as I would say we have to go beyond black supremacy. I think one of the things that we need to consider is that millions of little babies are being affected by the oppression around the country. And I heard little mention about the fact that these innocent little children caught up between the struggle. My comment here first and second, Christopher, is do you view the world crisis as outrageous, gross,
human rights violations is my first question. And my second question, Christopher, is would you say that these men uh, yield to God, our world leaders, do they even conceive in their confines at all that little children are being deprived of freedom? Okay, thank you for the call. Um, it's not obviously just at Christmas time that one thinks of uh, what a reproach it is that any child should um, have to suffer for the stupidities and crimes of, of people who know better, of uh, people like ourselves. Um, but I suppose that makes it a more appropriate time, for some people anyway, even people like myself who aren't, aren't lucky enough to have a belief in uh, God to sustain them. Um, aren't immune from the, uh, the Christmas sentiment. Um, that's, I suppose, why South Africa moves people so much, because though we know that the human race has all kinds of inherent difficulties and possibilities that it will, it's by nature unhappy, there are some things we can see that are done that are just unnecessary, that, that we know we can cure and that are, that are needless. And one of these is, is racial prejudice. Uh, any, any thinking person can see through it and outgrow it. And to see it in practice is, is an outrage. And uh, to feel that one's own government or one's own system is in any way condoning or supporting it is a terrible reproach also. So I hope that's, I hope that's a, a sort of answer to your question. Okay, we'll take a call from San Antonio, and then we'll get back to those two questions. Right. I'll ask our producer to hold off with calls for just a second so we can get those two responses. San Antonio, good morning. Morning. Uh, I think you make a good point on the uh, multilateral nature of the problem in South Africa. And I'm glad to hear that the African National Congress also recognizes it. Uh, I think it's easier to unite against something like the whites than I think you would see the divisions among the African National Congress be much more pronounced if they came into power. And. Uh, but uh, the government and media in the United States seem to make this a black versus white question. And ignoring in other countries oftentimes black on black and intertribal between black problems. I think the fear of some of us that are a little more to the right of yourself is that we'll exchange in South Africa a racial elite for a, a communist elite. Uh, I have two questions for you, though. You seem to think that uh, a the revolution is underway. Do you think the president government and the moderates that are in that government are finished? And the second question, do you see the ANC, if they were successful in the coming in power, at being pro-West or pro-Soviet? Thank you. Okay, uh, this is part of the answer to the question of before last as well. Um, I don't believe the story about the, uh, the moderates in the Botha government. I just don't know who they are. They've never successfully been identified, and certainly there's no action by which we could recognize them as moderate. As I say, the, the ideology of the National Party, the ruling party, is not just a racial one. It's a, it's a fascistic one. It's, it's one that grew out of admiration for the Third Reich and the losing side in the last war. And that, that's a, an important, I think, thing to bear in mind. Um, if they were ever going to be moderate, they've had ample chances to prove it. I mean, even at the time of the Sharpeville massacre, when there was such an outcry in 1961, um, around the time the ANC was banned, uh, the government was saying, ah, oh, but you wait, there's a reform program on the way, you know, what, what is all this international outcry about? Um, we're changing for the better. Quite to the contrary, it changed for the worse and continue to do so. I think that down the road, and here's part of the answer to the South African uh, army question I was asked earlier. Um, there's the real chance of a military coup in the country. Certainly at the moment, the army under General Magnus Milan effectively has a great share of state power. Um, and, for instance, uh, by the use of it, uh, keeps Namibia, Southwest Africa, an independent country under complete occupation and subjection. I also think, and it's a, it's a terrible uh, prospect, but I, I think a real one and one that hasn't yet been written about, there's a serious problem of... Um, uh, death squads in South Africa. A large number of people, opponents, black and white of the regime, have been disappearing or being mysteriously murdered. I think there's almost no doubt as to who's behind it, and very little doubt that uh, it will increase. I even wonder if the uh, allegedly anti-white bomb 
in uh, Durban yesterday was planted by uh, anyone who was really opposed to the regime. I'm afraid that um, the ideology and the entrenched racism of the National Party is uh, likely only to get worse as, as it approaches its, uh, its death agony. We'll go back then, uh, since you've answered three out of four, the fourth one is on the atrocities in the rest of Africa. Oh, yeah. Well, yes. I mean, I, I often, um, I mean, I'll give people the benefit of the doubt um, on that. I mean, just to say, well, the rest of Africa, it's all black. I mean, as if, you know, they all look alike to you, um, which is the unconscious assumption of a lot of these questions. I find objectionable. But let's admit that whatever the problem in the Congo is, for example, or Uganda, it isn't white minority rule. What I think... Uh, is distinctive about South Africa. And this is very well put by um, Joseph Lelyfeld of the New York Times in his really excellent book on the subject. Uh, it's called Move Your Shadow. It's published by New York Times Books. I really recommend it. It's the best anatomy of the topic um, that I've yet read. Uh, is this. If you are uh, poor in South Africa, which is a very rich country, it is because you're black. It's, it is a matter of state policy. If you're maltreated, and if you're exploited, and if you're told where you can and can't live, and if you're told that you can't vote, all the rest of it, it's deliberate. It's a, it's a systematic um, a policy. You're intended to be like that. Now, that isn't true in the same way of an unfortunate in the middle of the Uganda, Uganda Civil War, for example. It isn't, it isn't such a deliberate infliction on him, even if his condition, uh, as it would be in some cases, is a worse one. Um, Objectively, I hope, I hope that point has come across. I, I think it's one that uh, explains what some people always want to ask, which is why does one go on about South Africa so much? That's why. Um, did I leave anything out? Why do people go and work there when they're black? Because South Africa dominates the regional economy. It is, it is the, uh, it holds a commanding position in, in minerals and in industry in capital. If you live in Mozambique, for example, over the border, you have two options. You can either uh, cross the border and work as virtually a slave, as an indentured laborer with no rights whatever, uh, even fewer rights than a, a, a black South African. Or you can have no work at all. I don't really think, therefore, the person who resolves that problem by crossing the border as an indentured laborer is paying any compliment to the South African system. Newspapers this morning have many editorials on South Africa, from the Washington Times to the Washington Post. So we take our next call from Grand Rapids. I'll show you the Tony Auth cartoon in the Philadelphia Inquirer on South Africa. Good morning. Caller, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. I wanted to ask Mr. Hitchens about uh, South Africa and why everyone seems to be so against the homeland concept. Uh, maybe the way it's implemented right now is wrong, and I'm not certainly in favor of apartheid, but it doesn't seem to me, after living in the country for a few months, that there's actually going to be a power sharing, that, that, that it's possible, it's workable down there. Hmm. It seems like a division of the country and uh, separate rule is just about the only way that there's going to be uh, peace and a peaceful solution. Thank you. Well, some people have said that the, the end result of all this will be a repartition of the country, with, in effect, the whites building themselves a Bantistan um, and not trying to rule everybody else as well as themselves. Um, I think, myself, that's unlikely, because a repartition of the country would mean them giving up the areas that are rich in gold and uranium and, the other, and diamonds and the other reasons that they're there in the first place. Um, but your question's good. I mean, the, there, are, there, are only, there are only two possible outcomes. One is a generalized collapse of the country in which every racial, tribal, and national group tries to grab something for itself, including the white tribe. And the other is the, the solution of the ANC, which is a, a non-racial republic, which reminds me I do have a question unanswered, which is what form of government, whether pro-Eastern or pro-Western, I think that would take. Um, I think the answer to that question lies very much with the United States. Um, it, the United States has it in its power to resolve that question. If it persists in the present policy of, um, actually I think they're too embarrassed to continue calling it constructive engagement, but anyway, of effective collusion and collaboration with the South African regime, then the successor regime will not be friendly to the United States. Norfolk, Virginia, good morning. 
Yes, I have a question about uh, what he just said about <coughs> the being the uh, economic strength of the uh, nation itself. And I was just wondering about the newly formed Congress of South African Trade Unions. Uh, the leader, Mr. Elijah Briari, I don't know if that's pronounced that or not. He is uh, challenging the government. He's given them like a six month uh, to Mr. Both to abolish the task laws. Yes. And I was just wondering if because there's like 500,000 workers you know, under this union right now, throwing a strength. Uh, we have a slightly vague connection, I'm afraid. I'm not hearing everything you say. Um, Caller, would you start that sentence over again? We just lost that one. Excuse me? Could you start your last sentence over again. Okay. Do you, do you see a strike by this union as severely crippling the nation, and what do you see the United States doing? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well... Yeah, as I said earlier, I mean, the, the South African system, um, though it is based on a racial demarcation, uh, is also a system of exploitation. I mean, if, if it, even if it was, everyone there was the same color, uh, it would still be an outrageous system of exploitation. Um, and the emergence of the Congress of South African Trade Unions is one of the most powerful signs of that discontent in, in, in the last several years for the very reason you mentioned, which is the extreme vulnerability of an economy that's so heavily based on foreign investment. Already, you see, foreign investors are beginning to doubt whether they, they spent their money wisely and are reluctant to invest any more. Uh, the, the RAND, the national currency, al almost went through the floor the other day because of foreign confidence and, and its erosion. Um, so I think that a mass workers' movement is, is a very uh, likely means for the for the advancement of the uh, of the black and um, democratic cause. If you've just joined us recently, we're talking with Christopher Hitchens this morning. He is the Washington correspondent for this publication, The Nation. He uh, has been with the organization since 1978. Also, Washington correspondent for The Spectator, based in London, and writes a column on the American scene for London Times Literary Supplement. Uh, in your prior uh, assignments, you were foreign editor of the New Statements and author of a book called Cyprus. You're yeah. very well informed. We're, we've uh, got about 20 minutes left with Mr. Hitchens. Let's go next to Houma, Louisiana. Good morning. Yes, Mr. Hitchens, the last time I saw you on television was an interview that you did with that uh, South African black PR man. And I found that a very interesting interview uh, because of the fact that a black man was supporting the basic apartheid government. Where was it televised? Uh, if you don't mind me saying, it was on the uh, uh, cable news network. Okay. On Crossfire, and the thing that was I found very amazing is that Robert, well, the one of the course the uh, correspondents that was in the interview, really, um, I, I, what was I forgot some of the words that he used uh, that you, you felt like that you were backing a communist type government in South Africa and things like that. But just a few short questions. Number one, does the white government in South Africa have enough uh, artillery to to keep the, uh, the, the black population from just flat out overthrowing them, if it came down to that. Um, number two, what do you think will be, I know we've kind of dilly dallied around on this the whole program, but what do you think will be the final outcome of South Africa? And that's all. That's all I'd like to ask. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, actually I was, I, I still realize I've, I've left a question dangling which you've reminded me of about the armed forces. South Africa has tremendously sophisticated uh, Western provided armaments. Uh, it ranks really almost as a NATO member uh, with some of its alliances and with the sort of equipment to which it has access either from the West or from Israel. It also has nuclear weapons which it uh, acquired from the Israelis and the French or the technology for which it acquired from the Israelis and the French. Um, but none of this is going to do it any good. I mean, they can invade, and they do invade Angola. They've made incursions into Mozambique, into Zimbabwe. They occupy the whole of southwest Africa and Namibia. Um, and they could certainly beat any army that the rest of Africa combined could put in the field. But it's not going to help them against their own people. Um, I, I think there are fanatics in the government who would go as far as, say, Somoza did in his dying days and literally bomb their own cities. They're not going to nuclear bomb their own cities. The nukes are no good to them. Um, they, they are, in effect, powerless if the black majority simply decides to fold its arms and withdraw cooperation 
which I think is an increasingly likely scenario. Uh, because the system is based on the exploitation of cheap labor, the whites aren't going to start uh, going down the mines and uh, doing all the, all the dirty work. They, they're going to collapse if that happens. They will, of course, go to great lengths to ensure that it doesn't, uh, to try and decapitate the political leadership, to keep some of the statue of Nelson Mandela in prison uh, for a quarter of a century and so forth. But see how little good it's done them. I mean, people who weren't born when Nelson Mandela went into prison, and he hasn't been quoted in a South African newspaper since then. It's illegal to quote him. It's illegal to print his picture or his name. And everyone in South Africa knows who he is. And he's a hero to people who weren't born when he went inside. In the end, the whole attempt to keep this going by force is futile. It may end in blood and fire, or it could end uh, quickly and cleanly. And the reason why I go on about this is that the West could make a difference. Uh, that economy is plugged into ours. We could decouple. We could really bring pressure to bear. Um, the, what the administration fails to see is that doing nothing is a policy. Uh, doing nothing is a decision and looks to those on the bottom like a decision to stay with those on the top. And there's no escaping a decision of that clarity, in my view. Let me share another uh, editorial before we go to our next call. This is this morning's Washington Times. This is Mandela's show. They write, every incident such as this weekend's manhandling of Mrs. Mandela, no matter how provocative, chips away at the idea of ending apartheid gradually. State President P.W. Bota must act promptly and, yes, radically, to consign that monstrous system to the past. That's the Washington Times. Let's, let's go next to Rock Hill, South Carolina. Good morning, caller. Good morning. Morning. Uh, I like to uh, talk to Jim on TV. Oh, go ahead. What's your question? Paper. What is your question, sir? My question is, uh, ask him why was this lady Greg from her home in South Africa uh, the other day. And the only thing that uh, people want in South Africa is their freedom. That's all they want. That's what they're asking for. They're not asking for nothing against the white majority rule. They want freedom. That's what they want. Okay, thank you for the call. I agree. I mean, I, I don't think I, that needs, I think that was its own uh, comment. Can you, uh, last night on National Public Radio, uh, the commentators were referring to the scenario between Mrs. Mandela and Mr. Bota's government as mm. a chess game. Uh, could you comment on what, what is happening, uh, or at least your overview of it? No, chess is a much more fluent and fluid and subtle game than, than they know how to play. I mean, that was just another stupid uh, manifestation of, of uh, the apartheid regime. People say, why do they act so dumbly? You know, why do they get themselves in positions like that? It's the nature of the beast, I'm afraid. If you, if you say first to Mrs. Mandela, because you're black, you have to live in Soweto. She can't choose which part of Johannesburg she lives in. Then they say, well, you're free, but you can't go home to the place we otherwise say you have to go to. Um, what you've done is simply expose the, the ironies, if you like, the contradictions, the stupidities of your own system. Uh, none of the... Uh, None of the uh, apparent blunders of this regime, analyzed in the West as blunders, are blunders at all. They are, they are apartheid at work. New York City, good morning. 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 The uh, South African government has been reported as saying that they would release Nelson Mandela if he renounced violence. <coughs> uh, I'd like your comment on that. And also, don't you feel that in order to stave off a uh, resurrection, if you will, uh, from the right, from the army that you mentioned before, it's necessary to have not, quote, moderate, because the time has come for terms like that to be eliminated, uh, but someone who represents uh, very, very much the establishment to take the steps to move South Africa in a direction that perhaps we might consider more acceptable for their general populace. Okay. Um, the renunciation of violence is just a trick. Um, what they say is, we'll release you if you surrender. Nelson Mandela says, don't be, don't be ridiculous. He countered by saying he would, uh, he would uh, stay in prison if the South African government itself renounced violence. I mean, that's, you know, that's simply propaganda. Um, the time for it is a long time ago. If they wanted the ANC to renounce violence, they could have dealt with it uh, when it renounced violence itself. I mean, the ANC was a pacifist organization until very late in the day. Uh, Chief Albert Latuli, its, its chairman, I think certainly was a pacifist. Um, and I think I said earlier it was only in 1961 the decision was taken to move to resistance. Um, 
Mandela will, would rather stay in prison, would rather die, uh, than tell his people to surrender. And uh, that's a measure of his stature, in my view. Um, I don't think anyone really fell for, for Bota's con trick there. As for the moderates, uh, well, you, you said yourself it's become an absurd term, so I don't know where you're going to find the person of goodwill. I'm afraid that there's some, there seems to be something in the nature of the ideology of the National Party that prevents it from evolving moderates. I would think that, that the element of its ideology that prevents it from evolving moderates is to say that uh, moderation is the agency of the devil and that uh, their rule is biblically ordained. That doesn't kind of conduce to moderation. If you're watching this program live on this December 24th, we invite you to stay tuned. In about 10 minutes, we'll be uh, having our open phone session. And the topic this morning is the man of the year. Uh, next week, Time Magazine will be coming out with its annual issue naming the uh, event or uh, person who, for good or ill, has changed uh, uh, the world this year and we'd like to hear your nominations on whom you think would best be awarded the man of the year this year let's go for Christopher Hitchens way out west to Chula Vista California good morning you're on the air caller pardon you're on the air sir hi good morning I want to talk to your uh, your guest okay. host right there go ahead uh, you know you've already come across a couple of times about South Africa right yeah and, you know, I do agree with some of their philosophies. But there are certain things I don't agree with yours. Fair enough. Okay, why don't you name one and we'll respond to it. Okay, one of them is, why did they, why did the American, or how come the South African government arrest that lady in that government? Right. What do you disagree with, sir? Why did they, I want to know why they arrested her. Okay. I think we did respond. Uh, well, yes, but I, I mean, I can just say it quickly because she is, uh, while her husband, Nelson Mandela, remains in prison, where he's been for 21 years, as the spokesman of the black majority, she very courageously uh, acts as his spokesman and as she believes he would wish her to act while he's, <coughs> excuse me, while he's powerless. Uh, for this, she's incurred uh, the hatred and the repression of the South African government and has, for the last uh, decade at least, been in, in restriction, as they call it, which means that she's been confined to her home. The column that you've written in The Nation this week is called Minority Report. Uh, have you been filing some columns from Africa as you travel? That was the second of two that I did from, from uh, Southern Africa, yeah. It's, it's always called Minority Report. Oh. Um, that's its its name. How many do you anticipate writing on this topic? Do you have a schedule in mind? Um, well, it looks like it's not going to go away as an issue. It's going to stay in the headlines. So I hope I'll be able to keep up with it and I hope I'll be able to return. How long were you actually there? I was there for three weeks. Okay. Let's take our next call for you from Knoxville, Tennessee. Good morning. Morning. Okay. Your question, um, sir. First of all, I'd like to say that I enjoy your program very much. Thank you. And um, secondly, um, I'm very much against apartheid as a whole, but I think there are several questions that have to be answered. Um, people think that there are going to be two things happen. First of all, um, the blacks overthrow or there'll be some kind of um, uh, compromise. But um, I think you're dealing with the situation much like you had in India when they first achieved their freedom. I don't believe there's any black who can really rule the country of South Africa. They've been suppressed for so long. and. Uh, even if Nelson Mandela, you know, were released from prison, by any stretch of the imagination, I don't believe he's able to rule South Africa. Um, mm. That is not to say that they don't deserve their freedom. I believe they do, but, you know, the, the country is a very important e economic force in the world, and it can just not just be um, thrown to the wind of um, revolution. Thank you. Thank you. If you uh, took the executive of the African National Congress and added up all the university degrees and other qualifications that they have between them, not to speak of the decades in prison that they've amassed as well, the wastage of their time, uh, or rather, in spite of all that, you'd find that it easily, easily outbid the collected expertise and qualifications of the South African cabinet. There's no question at all that, that the ANC, if it's permitted to, can form a, an orderly uh, transition regime there and could be voted into power uh, if an election was held. Um, if that 
isn't allowed to happen. It's not the ANC's fault. And yes, there's a possibility if the uh, extreme right go down fighting that the place could go through a Lebanese experience before it gets to its independence. But what you can't stop is people wanting that independence by one means or another. They've taken the decision, as I put it in my article, that this is the last unfree generation, that they will survive the regime. That decision, once taken, is, is quite impossible to untake. So it'll come one way or another, and I repeat, uh, the Western democracies um, have a large role to play in deciding whether it'll come by, by democratic means or not. Mr. Hitchens, next call is from Anchorage. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's the uh, greatest show in the world going? Oh, thank you, sir. Happy holidays to you. Happy holidays to you. Uh, what I wanted to discuss is uh, the uh, advocacy of uh, disinvestment in South Africa on the part of uh, all, all sorts of uh, American entities, uh, university trust mm -hmm. funds, uh, municipal retirement funds, etc. And we, have, we up in Alaska, uh, believe it or not, we have a thing called our permanent fund and have uh, from our oil revenues uh, something in the order of uh, $10 billion invested in uh, Wall Street and various uh, securities. Uh, it, it just seems to me. Uh, yeah, I believe it. There are those who are advocating this um, have it backwards, so to speak. I think there's a tendency upon those who are uh, uh, acutely concerned about apartheid in South Africa. Uh, the advocacy of disinvestment uh, seems to be backwards. Uh, it's like running, it's like playing Pontius Pilate, washing one's hands of the situation. For example, if uh, the state of Alaska, rather than disinvesting, uh, if we were to go on to the stock market, I believe uh, of the 500 international corporations, uh, non-American corporations, the nine largest uh, in South Africa make the list, seven of them are available for purchase. In no case do any of those corporations uh, have a stock market value of a billion dollars. Uh, so our, we could effectively go in, uh, the state of Alaska's permanent fund, go in and buy uh, operative control of the uh, seven of the nine largest corporations in South Africa, and that's without getting into most of the uh, gold mine stocks. And I just wonder uh, if really that wouldn't be the way to go about it, just effectively uh, <coughs> have our pension fund uh, buy control of all the South African corporations and then... Uh, Maybe uh, we could uh, tell the corporations, uh, maybe you ought to allow the families to uh, live with the, uh, with the workers. We're going to build housing. We're going to uh, have equal pay. Uh, uh, and by golly, if it costs us a little bit for a while, why, maybe we'll just break even instead of making a profit. And then where is the South African government going to uh, uh, get their revenues? Thank you, sir. I have a suspicion that some of the people who are heavily advocating this uh, just don't like the profit motive. They don't like... Uh, uh, owning uh, equity and corporations they, uh, uh, from other philosophical positions they might have, uh, a la even Nation magazine. And, uh, uh, but I think it might be a more responsible way to go, and I think we might get uh, <laughs> more bang for the bunk buck and be acting responsibly and uh, putting an end to apartheid. Thank you very much. Okay, we're running out of time. Sure. Um, first, very flattering to get a call <clears throat> all the way from Anchorage in the great state of Alaska whose uh, Senator Ernest Gruning actually used to be um, editor of The Nation before he took Alaska into the Union. So I always feel a fellow feeling for anyone in Alaska. And that's certainly the most ingenious question we've had today, I think we'd have to say. That it, it, it had never occurred to me before actually to buy them out. And I really don't know whether they'd sell. Um, I think the, the African National Congress would probably say the, the resources, the, uh, most of which are actually underground in South Africa, it's a tremendously mineral-rich place, uh, belong to them and to the future, and they, they want to have a say in whoever owned them. But, um, and I think that would actually be their first response. But I just congratulate you for a, an amazingly ingenious um, proposal, all the same. Two minutes left. Our last call is from Roanoke. <coughs> Good morning. Excuse me. Good morning. How are you today? Fine, sir. I would like to... Uh find out uh, why it is perfectly okay to monkey, w that the American people should be able to monkey with a government from mm. an external point of view with a government that is non-communist, yet you as a uh, newspaper wish to prohibit us from monkeying with a communist government to turn it around to a free government. 
No, um, not quite. Um, what I said earlier was this. We already are intervening in South Africa. That's to say the, the flow of capital, investment, and weapons into South Africa all comes from the West. So the, the, the intervention's already been made. The point is, if we can intervene one way, why can't we intervene another? Um, since that relationship uh, doesn't exist between the United States government and any communist one, I don't think your analogy holds. But if it did, I'd be in favor of the same policy. We're out of time for Christopher Hitchens. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you for your questions and comments on South Africa. Interesting morning.